During last year's entirely precedented times, James Doherty did an excellent walking tour of the dark history of Waterford as part of the Imagine Arts Festival. Sadly, this year is an entirely different proposition, so, so we have a situation whereby James is going to have to record his dark history and we'll have to show it to you online as part of this year's Imagine Arts event. We'd like to thank the Theatre Royal for facilitating us here today. And uh, Jim, welcome. Thanks, Darren. First of all, tell me, what is a dark history? I suppose it's um, the easiest way to explain it is remember when you were in school, you'd talk about a certain topic and the teacher would always say to you, oh, well, this happened, but you know, we can't put that in the book because it's a bit too gory or a bit too grim. So really, I suppose dark history is the little bits of society, ourself, our country, our place, that don't tend to get talked about too much or don't tend to get printed about a lot because by their very nature, they're a little bit grim, a little bit dark, a bit violent, a bit troubled. So dark history explores that and it's kind of an emerging theme in history at the moment. I suppose I, I suppose my own personal interest, I think that you kind of need to learn from history, but you need to learn from all your history. So you can't kind of cherry pick the good mm. over the bad. So basically I suppose it, dark history looks at some of the more, shall we say, grim, darker events of Waterford's history. So would this be a good time to tell viewers that it might get a little bit grim, might get a little bit violent? Yeah, yeah. So is there an age warning on this? Yes, one? most definitely, yeah. Okay, so tell me, how dark a place was Waterford back in the day? I suppose a lot of what I'm going to talk about today looks at, uh, I suppose, levels of violence and the media, um, present company excluded, <laughs> have a lot to do with it. Um, society today is portrayed as being a very violent place. You know, if someone dies in a, in a brutal murder in Dublin or Cork, it's mm. frontline news and makes television. But if you look at Warford in the 18th, 19th century, Warford was a fairly violent place. You can look at a report on a fair in Ballybricken and at the very bottom of the report or the news article will say two died in violent scuffle afterwards. Mm. Uh, the use of casual violence often associated of course with alcohol consumption was quite common and so Warford I think was probably even a more violent place in, in many ways than it is today but again we wouldn't think that when you look at history we always think today we're surrounded by violence and murder but in the past it was fairly grim as well. I suppose um in the, in, as at the moment, in present times, a lot of violence that happens is quite covert. Uh, it kind of happens behind closed doors most of the time. But we were, we were talking earlier, and you were saying like there's a lot of overt violence, a lot of kind of riots that happen on the, the streets of Waterford back then. Yeah, and again, if, if you read today about a violent riot, and um, we probably all remember several years ago, there was a Love Ulster parade where there was violence in Grafton Street when the, they came down from the north, and that made international news. Mm or semi-organised mass rioting in Watford history wasn't that uncommon and would never even make the front page of a newspaper. Let me give an example of some of the riots. Um, in the late 18th century, we had in the presence of the city quite often the, the press gang. Now just to divert slightly, what is a press gang? The British Navy often struggled to get recruits for the naval service. Uh, extreme brutality amongst the, 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 the crew um, against their kind of corporate punishment and the, the whole system. Uh, so also poor wages, poor food, etc. No one wanted to be in the Royal Navy. So in times of war, they often basically kidnapped people and it was called impressment and the, the press gang. And Warford in particular, um, like many port cities, was a target because what they wanted was young, able-bodied men who knew the way around boats. Mm. Where better to get them? A port. So one example of a, of a mass riot was the press gang was operating on the quay in the 1770s. They had taken young men and put them aboard a ship to be sent off to the Royal Navy. News spread and a mass riot broke out on the quay with involving several, several hundred people. Um, there was serious violence and um, there was no actual deaths. And when the kind of local citizenry of Waterford got the better of the press gang, they then proceeded to break up completely two pubs on a quay that the press gang had been used earlier in the day. Mm. Uh, they freed the men off the ship and they kind of retreated uh, victorious and the press gang had to leave the city by ship in a hurry. And that didn't, wasn't that unusual, like a mass organised riot between members of the Royal Navy and the citizenry of Wardford. Um, you also have the militia riots, which I kind of find very grim but quite humorous really, to be honest with you. The militia in Waterford was like an army reserve. They trained for one month of the year, um, but it had a bizarre system of the militia from other towns would come to Waterford to train. So we'd have, we'd host the Tipperary or Fermoy militia. They train in the barracks here in Waterford for a month, but 
bizarrely what happened is that the last day of training they were paid the month's wages but they were paid their wages here in Waterford before they went home so invariably often what happened with the militia was they all basically went drinking um, there were several militia riots one example in the 1860s was the Tipperary militia about 400 men were basically causing trouble on the quay mass violence had broke out the mayor and the city hall we were just beside us here in the Theatre Royal he sent up to the army barracks for soldiers to break up the riot they proceeded down from the barracks um, that didn't go well they just joined in the drinking with the militia so that now they had more men and they were better armed so the mayor held a meeting in the, in the, in the mayor's parlour where he called for a body of fine resolute Wardford men to break up the riot the mayor of the city and about 40 50 men armed with staves and clubs proceeded along the pubs in the quay basically beating up any militia men or soldiers they found and the mayor then brought the head of the army in Watford the next day and the head of the militia in Watford the next day into the mayor's parlour to show off his fine collection of bloody bayonets that he'd taken as trophies of war. Now, to me, that kind of resonates with something like you'd see in gangs in New York. Yeah. The mayor of Watford with a stave breaking heads on the quay. But again, not overly uncommon. The Fenian rights in 1867. The Fenians landed men and arms, tried to land arms, but landed men in 1867 here in Watford down Helvick. A large body of these men were captured and immediately sent to Cork. Through a miscommunication, five of these men were only a couple of guards arrived in Watford on the train. Immediately when they arrived in Watford, the people of Watford realised these were captured Fenian nationalist soldiers and they had a very small attachment of police guarding them. The police panicked. They tried to get from the train station up to the barracks as fast as they could, but a riot developed. And actually the report of that riot said that the fish selling women of Wardford were highly proficient with the use of throwing stones and caused the most violence on the day. The actual Fenians that they were trying to rescue were badly injured by flying projectiles. Right? When they got up to the police station or at the barracks or where the modern day guard station is, the only way they could rescue the prisoners was by mounted police. The RIC emerged from the back of the barracks, mounted on heavy horse, armed with swords, charged down Patrick Street and took the sword to the right. Um, two people died and qu quite, quite a large number were injured. But again, that wasn't an, like an overly odd occurrence. The funerals associated with that right, there was huge potential for violence there, yeah. but only an appeal direct from the bishop stopped violence at the right. So that kind of serious level of violence and was actually a favourite weapon at the time were belt buckles by the men. Men tended to wear very heavy belt buckles and in times of violence, take off the belt, wrap the belt and the buckle around their hand. And that was a very common weapon amongst average people. But swords, bayonets, staves, sticks would be very common as well. Undertaking must have been a, yeah, a, a thriving <laughs> trade back then, was yeah. it? You mentioned, uh, you mentioned barracks and the militia there. Um, Waterford was a garrison city at the time, so there must have been some uh, kind of friction between the, the locals and the, and the British Army, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, like that, that, and again, that wouldn't be unusual. If you look at mo modern day garrison towns in, in the different parts of the world, there often is friction between the regular army and the locals. When you think about it, it can be easy to see how friction could develop, um, such as these are men that have a job, they have an income, they also have accommodation and food, so they have disposable income. So, you know, they're drinking in the pubs, buying the local girls drink. They're also quite exotic. Like, these are men who could tell the young girls, that, oh, I've been to India, I've seen an elephant, I've seen a tiger, you know? So they've travelled the world, which wasn't that common. But the relationship between different units and the citizens of Waterford changed. Often you'd read reports from the mayor again at the Times and he'd say, oh, last night I had Colonel Darren Skelton from the Queen's Own Highlanders for dinner. I'd like to thank him for his time here in Waterford and wish him all the best. Now, unfortunately, we all know that the, the South Wales borderers are coming back next month and we all know what happened the last time they were here. So it varied from unit to unit, but yeah, there could be friction. Um, in 1885, the violence had erupted and this was at the time the South Wales borderers this was a nightly event, fighting between soldiers and, and people in, in Ballybricken. And violence had erupted uh, down towards the Bunkers Hill area. The fight started there and worked all the way up to the barracks. And a young man called Peter Grant tried to break up a fight where he saw a soldier being isolated and being kicked to death on the ground. He stepped in to try and pull the soldier out. And a bayonet charge of drunken soldiers came down Bunkers Hill, saw him near the soldier and ran him through with a bayonet and he died on the spot. 
another case fairly similar. Um, there was a riot where the uh, infantry barracks is today. The soldiers retreated into the barracks and all the people in Warford basically started to smash all the windows in the barracks with rocks and stones. Shots were fired over the roof of the barracks and a young boy called Matthew Hayes who lived on Barrack Street came out to watch this. I suppose it was a form of entertainment really. And he was standing on a street corner and a bullet ricocheted off the ground, came up and basically decapitated him. He, had, he, he suffered horrendous injuries. At the time the media reported that they thought the soldiers were using dum-dums or explosive bullets. That's highly unlikely. More than likely what caused the huge level of injury he had was the bullet had already hit something else before it hit him, fragmented and caused massive damage. Um, but again, violence against soldiers is not uncommon, often with quite tragic results. How on earth were they, were they policing well, the streets of Waterford back then? There must have been some kind of punishments. That yeah, they... well, interestingly enough, there was, like, first of all, it was an armed police force, the Royal Irish Constabulary. Mm. They were granted the prefect Royal in 1867 after they crushed the Fenian Rebellion. Um, they were an armed paramilitary force, mounted, carrying rifles, pistols, sword bayonets. So even the whole form of policing uh, back then was a lot more, I suppose you would say, almost aggressive. But in both those cases I mentioned about the rights between soldiers, both of the men involved in that were arrested the next morning, held by the police and charged with their deaths. Now unfortunately, by the time I got to court and it all kind of came out in the wash, the cases were very much watered down. The soldiers involved received very extremely light sentences. There was no real punishment. But the, the police were often in quite uh, kind of caught in the middle. A lot of these policemen were Irish. They, a lot of them were locals. So they were often trying to walk a bit of a tightrope between the army and the citizenry. So, like, can you give me an example of some of the, the more extreme punishments that would have been seen for... Yeah, people. like uh, flogging was was on uh, wasn't unheard of, um, and where we are now actually is quite close to Reginald's Tower. And Reginald's Tower was used kind of like as a 19th century kind of uh, temporary prison, a drunk tank. And one report actually complained about the stench coming from Reginald's Tower. Now, it gives you an insight into the attitude at the time, because the people who are writing they didn't care about the prisoners. Their problem was, the mall just outside Tutor Royal today was a place where women and men would walk of a summer's evening and um, kind of congregate and associate. And they basically said that the smell coming from Reginald's Tower is ruining our nice walk. I mean, they didn't care about poor guys stuck in Reginald's mm. Tower. Now, another example, I suppose, of that attitude towards uh, punishment, um, the Royal Navy flogged a man, and quite often people died from flogging. Flogging, of course, the use of a whip. They flogged a man on board a ship here down at the quay in the 1850s and it was a quite brutal flogging. He received over a hundred lashes right? um, and there was complaints. There was letters written from the city to the Royal Navy complaining about the flogging and not of the violence. The point the mayor made at the time was, could you not do it further down the river? You're ruining the kind of nice day out the for ambience. the people. Yeah, you know, do it out of sight. Mm. They didn't care about the actual guy getting flogged. One of the worst, I suppose, cases of flogging I came across was in 1860. There was a man called Power, and he was a serial deserter. He joined military units, mm. get the uniform, get the king's shilling, right, and then run away as a slightest opportunity. Steal the uniform, of course, and whatever else he could. But he was found out, and he was caught. He received 100 lashes tied to a spread eagle, tied to a wheel of a big cannon here in the artillery barracks. Mm. And when they were finished with him, the, uh, the head of his owners branded him on the chest with a hot poker. So they had a brazier with hot coal lighting while they were flogging the guy. You can just imagine he's tied to this artillery piece and he can see and smell the smoke of this poker getting hot. When they're finishing, they throw salt water on him to, that's to kind of seal the wounds. And then they took out a specially made poker with the initials BC on it. Red hot on the chest, bad character. Right. Now, the idea of this is, if you join a military unit, you're always told to take your top off. And what they're looking for is people have served before and have had a bad record. Because if you've served and you have a bad record, you'd have the mark of the lash on your back. So if that man ever went to join another military unit, he'd be found out. Bad character. Is there scope so, to bring that back? Yes, well, yeah, some <laughs> would argue, yeah. You'd bring it down to the circuit court. <laughs> yeah. Um, has ever, I've always wondered this, has there, has there been... Um, Executions in Waterford? Yeah, there has. Yeah, um, 
we had a county in the city gallows and um, digressing slightly um, the city the county gallows or the gibbet is uh, underneath the 18th hole of the the, the golf club across in Ferrymac. Mm. and one day in lockdown I, I took a walk over there and I brought my young daughter up there when she got there she turned around and said daddy I want to go home she didn't like it right and so only actually when I went to home and brought up the records and looked at the actual spot, mm. I found out that's the site of the old gibbet. Right. So I don't know if it's just not like golf or, or <laughs> she didn't like the location. Yeah. But yeah, there was a city and there was a county gallows and public executions were quite common. They moved indoors, for want of a better word, after a while because thinking started to change. And I think the thought was that uh, they weren't an appropriate kind of public spectacle. Like two executions stick out in my mind for different reasons, right? There was a uh, case of Dunphy and uh, there was another case of a man called Walsh. The Walsh case was earlier, it was around 1860, 1864. He had a reputation of being quite an unpleasant man and they're not really sure what happened, but was it an argument to kind of escalate or whatever, but he bet another, and he's quite old, he's well in the 60s, he bet another man to death with a stave right, over some sort of disagreement mm. and he was sentenced to be hung. Now, the gallows at the time was where the modern police station is and the, I suppose, a bit of a rush of blood to the head, they invested in a new mechanical gallows. So if you can imagine these big high walls of the old jail and right on the top there was a steel contraption that kind of wheeled out, right, very high tech. Okay. Right? This kind of steel contraption wheeled out and it was a trap door. They bring the prisoner up and there's thousands of people had gathered to see this public execution in the green and by Bricken. And you had people going around selling hot, well not, not hot dogs, but whatever the equivalent of the time was. Pig's ears. Fresh pig's ears probably, <laughs> refreshments. So it was a big public event. Mm. Anyway, they brought Mr. Walsh out. He'd seen the priest, he'd said his act of contrition. They brought him out. They pulled this lever on their new mechanical debt gallows contraption and nothing happened right so he's standing there and the it had stuck right so this of course excites great jeering and laughing from the crowd right wow. they sent for a uh, kind of mechanic a hammer was produced passed up along and a prison warden warden has to lean over the wall while this guy is standing there and start whacking the bottom of the contraption and um, nothing happens they sent for a bigger hammer Right, naturally enough. They come back with a kind of a sledgehammer type thing. They start whacking the bottom of this. Again, initially nothing happens, but the, the, I suppose the blows of the hammer build up a, a type of tension in the contraption. And when the uh, gallows finally opens, Mr. Walsh ends up shooting down through the gallows and is more or less beheaded in the whole process. Of course, this is all in full public view. And, and it, it kind of does all kind of reports and talk later and be like, like, you know, like this is getting out of control because like, this why are people learning from this but it was a big public event and that is one I suppose execution that would stand out because it was so botched it was a farcical yeah. affair and not um, I can't imagine uh, it, it served any kind of purpose really now another one and it was one of the most famous Waterford executions it was reported nationally and internationally at the time was a man called Peter Dunphy. His wife had died and he was left uh, with seven children and a son of his mysteriously fell ill, right? And then several weeks later, he brought his other son downtown. They went into a public house. He left the young boy wait outside. He came back from the public house, gave him a bottle of lemonade and within minutes, the boy outside uh, started to con have contractions and fell ill and died. Now, the authorities were suspicious because he had two sons who do, died kind of quite mysteriously, quite close together. And they sent his for autopsy, this was in 1899, and they found strychnine, a rat poison in the system. So the father had poisoned his own two sons for an insurance payout. The insurance value on the second son was about eight pounds, so not a huge sum, mm. uh, but he basically murdered him for money. Now, the time has slightly changed, but the time Mr. Dunphy was executed, and it was one of the last executions held in Watford, that was in 1899. That was done inside the prison, behind closed doors, away from the public guy. Uh, because the whole, I suppose, perception of uh, public executions had changed. But they, of the executions that happened in the history of Warford, they too had kind of jump out at you. 
you've done a lot of um, you've done a lot of history. You've done a lot of dark history. You're going through a lot of the archives. You're 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 happening across some really grotesque things. We'll finish on this. Is there any particular stories that stand out as being particularly bad that even you struggle with the the idea yeah, of them? Yeah, like just I suppose two that kind of jump out at me for different reasons. Again, the Dunphy case will be one. Um, like yourself, I have young children, and like how anyone could do that and the frame of mind to do that and do it for just a very limited monetary gain, I'd find quite hard to kind of get my mm. head around, you know. And I suppose, like every person, like once you have children yourself, your whole attitude to life and everything changes. And when you read stories of violence towards children, etc., that that certainly makes an, an impact. Another case would date from the Irish Civil War, 19, August 1922. Um, Waterford had been taken by the anti-treaty, uh, or sorry, the, the pro-treaty National Army at this stage. The Civil War was kind of in its dying days, more or less. And there was a barracks, an empty police barracks in short course, and they had fired it. it was, the IRA had set fire to it. Mm. And this was done to lure troops out of the main barracks. A Commandant O'Brien walked from where the police station is today, the barracks, across the short course. As he's walking through short course, a man stepped out uh, from behind the closed door and shot him in the back and then just ran away. I suppose with that one I kind of find it sad in that the Civil War really had run its course. And I think, you know, well obviously you can't condone any kind of violence, but to shoot a man in the back uh, I think is a very cowardly act and the young man Commandant O'Brien was only 24, mm. and he'd served in the IRA in the War of Independence. He was now a Free State soldier, gone to investigate this fire. He never stood a chance, really, gunned down from behind, and then the assailant ran away. I just, I, th I think, I suppose, really, the unfairness of it. You know, he, he never had a chance, really. So that's, that's one thing that sticks with me. And there's, there's probably huge scope now for, for, for a lot more dark history stories that are that are out there. You must have some plans for the future. Yeah, well, hopefully you'd like to get back on the streets next year mm. for, with the Imagine Arts again. It might be something I might do, try and do maybe once a month or something like that. It's, it's, it, um, there is an interest in it. And I suppose, like you said, <coughs> there's always more. You always come across more. And you always find more details. And what you often find is even what's printed, the real details are even harder again mm. when you start looking into it because even back then, they wouldn't print some items. And then people will come to you, like when I did Dark History Walks last year, and I won't mention anyone's name, but I was approached at the end of it, and a woman basically said to me, oh, wait, I tell you what happened to my grandfather. Right. And it was very grim and all that, yeah. right? So people will contact you and go, oh, you know, have you read about X? Or have you read about Y? Or do you know anything about this? So yeah, there's always scope for it, and it says like something. And hopefully, like I said, it's something we could do back on the streets, because when you're walking around streets like Short Course and that, in the, in the heart of Barry Bricken, you get more of a sense, and also you can point out some of the buildings and the places that still stand today. It gives people a better sense of the whole, I suppose, of the event that happened. Well, I'm sure it won't be long before you're uh, referring back to the dark history of 2020. But, yeah, I'm going to skip now, that one. <laughs> but for now, for the Imagine Arts Festival, thank you very much, James Darren. Thank you, Darren. It's a pleasure. Thank you, and thanks to Teeter Royal for having us in.